Section twelve of the Adventures of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Parik Colum. Part one, chapter sixteen. Now Thetis, the mother of Achilles, went to Olympus where the gods have their dwellings, and to the house of Hephaestus, the smith of the gods. That house shone above all the houses on Olympus, because Hephaestus himself had made it of shining bronze. And inside the house there were wonders, handmaidens that were not living, but that were made out of gold, and made with such wondrous skill that they waited upon Hephaestus and served and helped him as though they were living maids. Hephaestus was lame and crooked of foot, and went limping. He and Thetis were friends from old time, for when his mother would have forsaken him because of his crooked foot, Thetis and her sister reared him within one of the ocean's caves, and it was while he was with them that he began to work in metals. So the lame god was pleased to see Thetis in his dwelling, and he welcomed her and clasped her hand, and asked of her what she would have him do for her. Then Thetis, weeping, told him of her son Achilles, how he had lost his dear friend, and how he was moved to go into the battle to fight with Hector, and how he was without armour to protect his life, seeing that the armour that the gods had once given his father was now in the hands of his foe. And Thetis besought Hephaestus to make new armour for her son, that he might go into battle. She no sooner finished speaking than Hephaestus went to his workbench and set his bellows, twenty there were, working. And the twenty bellows blew into the crucibles, and made bright and hot fires. Then Hephaestus threw into the fires bronze and tin and silver and gold. He set on the anvil-stand a great anvil, and took in one hand his hammer, and in the other hand his tongs. For the armour of Achilles he first made a shield, and then a corslet that gleamed like fire and he made a strong helmet to go on the head, and shining greaves to wear on the ankles. The shield was made with five folds, one fold of metal upon the other, so that it was strong and thick that no spear or arrow could pierce it, and upon this shield he hammered out images that were a wonder to men. The first were images of the sun and the moon, and of the stars that the shepherds and the seamen watch, the Pleiades and the Hyads and Orion and the Bear, that is also called Wayne, and below he hammered out the images of two cities. In one there were people going to feasts and playing music, and dancing and giving judgments in the marketplace. The other was a city besieged. There were warriors on the walls, and there was an army marching out of the gate to give battle to those that besieged them. And below the images of the cities he made a picture of a ploughed field, with ploughmen driving their yokes of oxen along the furrows and with men bringing them cups of wine. And he made a picture of another field, where men were reaping, and boys were gathering the corn, where there was a servant beneath an oak tree making ready a feast, and women making ready barley for a supper for the men who were reaping, and a king standing apart and watching all, holding a staff in his hands, and rejoicing at all he saw. And another image he made of a vineyard, with clusters of grapes that showed black, and with the vines hanging from silver poles. And he showed maidens and youths in the vineyard, gathering the grapes into baskets, and one amongst them, a boy who played on the viol. Beside the image of the vineyard he made images of cattle, with herdsmen, and with nine dogs guarding them. But he showed two lions that had come up and had seized the bull of the herd, and the dogs and men strove to drive them away, but were affrighted and beside the image of the oxen he made the image of a pasture-land, with sheep in it, and sheepfolds and roofed huts. He made yet another picture, a dancing place with youths and maidens dancing, their hands upon each other's hands, beautiful dresses and wreaths of flowers the maidens had on, and the youths had daggers of gold hanging from their silver belts. A great company stood around those who were dancing, and amongst them there was a minstrel who played on the lyre. Then all around the rim of the shield, Hephaestus, the lame god, set an image of ocean, whose stream goes round the world. Not long was he in making the shield and the other wonderful pieces of armour. 
and as soon as the armour was ready, Thetis put her hands upon it, and flying down from Olympus like a hawk, brought it to the feet of Achilles, her son. And Achilles, when he saw the splendid armour that Hephaestus the lame god had made for him, rose up from where he lay, and took the wonderfully wrought piece in his hands, and he began to put the armour upon him, and none of the Myrmidons who were around could bear to look upon it, because it shone with such brightness, and because it had all the marks of being the work of a god. CHAPTER Seventeen. Then Achilles put his shining armour upon him, and it fitted him as though it were wings. He put the wonderful shield before him, and he took in his hands the great spear that Chiron the centaur had given to Peleus his father, the spear that no one else but Achilles could wield. He bade his charioteer harness the immortal horses, Xanthos and Balios. Then, as he mounted his chariot, Achilles spoke to the horses. Xanthos and Balios, he said, this time bring the hero that goes with you back safely to the ships, and do not leave him dead on the plain, as ye left the hero Patroclus. Then Xanthos the immortal steed spoke, answering for himself and his comrade. Achilles, he said, with his head bowed and his mane touching the ground. Achilles, for this time we will bring thee safely back from the battle. But a day will come when we shall not bring thee back, when thou too shalt lie with the dead before the walls of Troy. Then was Achilles troubled, and he said, Xanthos, my steed, why dost thou remind me by thy prophecies of what I know already, that my death too is appointed, and that I am to perish here, far from my father and my mother and my own land? Then he drove his immortal horses into the battle. The Trojans were affrighted when they saw Achilles himself in the fight, blazing in the armour that Hephaestus had made for him. They went backward before his onset, and Achilles shouted to the captain of the Greeks, No longer stand apart from the men of Troy, but go with me into the battle and let each man throw his whole soul into the fight. And on the Trojan side Hector cried to his captains and said, Do not let Achilles drive you before him even though his hands are as irresistible as fire, and his fierceness as terrible as flashing steel, I shall go against him and face him with my spear. But Achilles went on, and captain after captain of the Trojans went down before him. Now amongst the warriors whom he caught sight of in the fight was Polydorus, the brother of Hector, and the youngest of all King Priam's sons. Priam forbade him ever to go into the battle, because he loved him as he would love a little child. But Polydorus had gone in this day, trusting to his fleetness of foot to escape with his life. Achilles saw him, and pursued him, and slew him with his spear. Hector saw the death of his brother. Then he could no longer endure to stand aside to order the battle. He came straight up to where Achilles was brandishing his great spear. And when Achilles saw Hector before him he cried out, here is the man who most deeply wounded my soul, who slew my dear friend Patroclus. Now shall we two fight each other, and Patroclus shall be avenged by me. And he shouted to Hector, Now, Hector, the day of thy triumph and the day of thy life is at its end. But Hector answered him without fear, Not with words, Achilles, can you affright me. Yet I know that thou art a man of might and a stronger man than I but the fight between us depends upon the will of the gods. I shall do my best against thee, and my spear before this has been found to have a dangerous edge." He spoke, and lifted up his spear and flung it at Achilles. Then the breath of a god turned Hector's spear aside, for it was not appointed that either he or Achilles should be then slain. Achilles darted at Hector to slay him with his spear, but a god hid Hector from Achilles in a thick mist. Then in a rage Achilles drove his chariot into the ranks of the war, and many great captains he slew. He came to Scamandros, the river that flows across the plain before the city of Troy, and so many men did he slay in it that the river rose in anger against him for choking its waters with the bodies of men. Then on towards the city he went like a fire raging through a glen that had been parched with heat. Now on a tower of the walls of Troy Priam, the old king, stood, and he saw the Trojans coming in a rout towards the city, 
and he saw Achilles in his armour blazing like a star, like a star that is seen at harvest time and is called Orion's dog, the star that is the brightest of all stars, but yet is a sign of evil. And the old man Priam sorrowed greatly as he stood upon the tower and watched Achilles, because he knew in his heart whom this man would slay, Hector, his son, the protector of his city. End of section 12